Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jeff Brenzel, and I teach here at Yale in the Philosophy and Humanities departments. In my role as Master of Timothy Dwight College, I am also the official steward of the Chubb Fellowship at Yale University. So it is on behalf of the Chubb Fellowship of Timothy Dwight College, of the President and Officers and Fellows of Yale University, the faculty and staff and students of Yale, and the entire New Haven area community that we welcome His Holiness the 17th Karmapa and his delegation to our community and to our campus. I want to recognize briefly the co-sponsors and the other collaborators who have worked hard to arrange and support the visit of His Holiness and his delegation here to Yale. In addition to the Chubb Fellowship, these are the Yale Himalaya Initiative, the Forum on Religion and Ecology, the Yale Religious Studies Department, the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, the Yale Divinity School, and the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. We are particularly grateful, of course, to His Holiness himself for his generosity of time and spirit in making himself astonishingly available during his time here, putting forth a strenuous effort to meet or speak or connect with so many communities within and without the university who hoped for the opportunity to see and hear him during his stay here at Yale. I want to make special mention of the many members of the Tibetan community from the entire eastern region of the United States who have traveled here to be with us this afternoon, as well as many other Buddhist brothers and sisters from other lands and places, to all of you, I want to extend our warmest welcome. Here this afternoon, His Holiness will be presenting this year's Chubb Fellowship Address. And I should say just a brief word about the fellowship itself. Hendon Chubb was an 1895 graduate of Yale's Sheffield Scientific School, and in 1936, he made a substantial gift to the university with the intent of encouraging Yale students to take a particular interest in public service. Since 1949, as Hendon Chubb himself approved, the university has used his endowment to underwrite a visiting speakers program bringing extraordinary public figures to the campus. Past Chubb Fellows include four presidents of the United States, presidents of eight other countries, Nobel and other international prize winners, and more than 150 other regional, national, and internationally prominent persons, all of whom have been noteworthy in some particular way for their personal distinction in service to the common good of all. It is now my honor to ask Andrew Quintman to the podium. Professor Quintman teaches at Yale in the Department of Religious Studies where he specializes in the Buddhist traditions of Tibet and the Himalaya. His work surveys Buddhist literature and history, sacred geography and pilgrimage, and the visual cultures of the wider Himalayan region. He has written several books on the early Tibetan saint, Milarepa, including an English translation of the life of Milarepa, who is a founding figure in the, in, the, in the Karmapa's lineage. Well, please welcome Professor Quintman. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure and distinct honor to introduce His Holiness, the 17th Karmapa, Oregon Chinle Dorje who will share with us today his insight and vision on three crucial topics for our time, compassion, religion, and the environment. 
In 1949, at the request of Yale's Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, 100 volumes of the Tibetan Buddhist canon were printed from wood blocks in Lhasa, wrapped in leather satchels and loaded onto ponies. They traveled by caravan to Calcutta and then freighter to New Haven, where they arrived in 1950 and were installed in the library with great ceremony. This gift, presented to Yale by the current Dalai Lama, who was only 14 years old at the time and still living in Lhasa, planted a seed of Yale's connection to Tibet, a seed that has now taken root and blossomed with the visit by His Holiness the Karmapa. The Karmapa is part of a Tibetan tradition of formally recognized reincarnations known as tulku, wherein a young child is identified as the re-embodiment of a deceased master. The Karmapas are the head of the Karmakagyu branch of Tibetan Buddhism and are the oldest such reincarnation lineage in the Himalayan region, extending back some 900 years. His Holiness, Oregon Chinle Dorje, is the 17th in his line. The first Karmapa, Dusum Kemba, was born in the early 12th century and is said to have left a letter foretelling the conditions of his future rebirth. Since then, such prediction letters have become a hallmark of the lineage and together with other religious signs have been used to identify subsequent Karmapas. The second Karmapa, Karmapakshi, was renowned for his spiritual mastery which led to his invitation to the court of Kublai Khan. The third Karmapa, Rangjung Dorje, was famous for his exegesis on philosophy and esoteric Buddhist theory. And subsequent Karmapas became consummate religious teachers, great scholars, virtuoso meditators, artists, and poets. They were also teachers who carried out the activities of a Buddha, as the title Karmapa is sometimes etymologized. The 16th Karmapa, Rangchung Rikbe Dorje, fled Tibet in 1959 and established a monastic seat in Sikkim, India. He is remembered for, for his great love of animals, especially birds, and also for his ability to communicate with them. The 16th was part of an early wave of Tibetan teachers who brought traditional Buddhist teachings to the West he visited the United States first in 1974 and again in 1977. And during this period, he established a major monastic center outside Woodstock, New York, which now has dozens of affiliated centers around the world. Oregon Chinle Dorje was born in 1985 in Eastern Tibet. And based upon his predecessor's prediction letter and testament, he was recognized and then enthroned as the 17th Karmapa at the traditional monastery of his lineage at Serpu in central Tibet. And I was fortunate to meet His Holiness numerous times at Serpu, and it was clear even then that he was an extraordinary individual. In 1999, he determined that he was no longer able to receive an adequate religious education inside Tibet, and so, over the course of eight days in late December and early January, he undertook a harrowing journey across the Himalayan range. The story is quite dramatic. It includes a daring escape through an upper story window of the monastery, a trek across frozen mountain passes, and horseback travel through northern Nepal. He eventually reached Dharamsala uh, in India, where he maintains a close relationship with another of Tibet's great religious figures, the 14th Dalai Lama. At 29 years old, his holiness is already recognized as a leading religious figure of his generation, as an accomplished Buddhist teacher. But he is also a prolific artist, poet, and playwright. He is a religious reformer dedicated to gender equality and the restoration of bhikshuni, or full monastic ordination for women. He is a social activist committed to human rights, vegetarianism, and the ethical treatment of animals. He is an environmentalist focused on the protection of Himalayan landscapes and natural resources through an eco-monastic program called Koryuk, the Tibetan word for environment, that networks more than 50 religious institutions across the Himalaya. In His Holiness's own words, 
whatever it is I do, I want it to have a long-term visible impact and for it to be practical. If I have the opportunity, I would, like, I would most like to restore the natural environment in the Himalayas and Tibet and to especially protect the forests, the water, and the wildlife of the region. And I think it is not an exaggeration to say that His Holiness, the 17th Karmapa, will revolutionize Buddhism, not only in the Tibetan tradition, but also on a global scale. The reach of the Karmapa's activities is reflected in the way that his visit uh, has brought people across, uh, has brought people together across Yale University, from the arts and sciences to public health and environmental studies, faculty, graduate students, and undergraduates. Some time ago, long before His Holiness's visit had been publicly announced, one of the eight Tibetans who works at Yale appeared in my office and enthusiastically said, I heard the Karmapa is coming. Well, he was. Today's address, entitled Compassion in Action, Buddhism and the Environment is the direct result of converging interests, or as Buddhists like to say, of causes and, of, and conditions that span the university and its wider community. So the seed first planted some 65 years ago has now begun to flower. So please join me now in welcoming His Holiness, the 17th Karmapa. Do you want to stand next to me or you want to sit? It's just for a minute. Thank you, Your Holiness. This way. So let me conclude with just a few words about today's program. Following His Holiness's address, uh, he will be joined on stage by myself and my colleague, Mary Evelyn Tucker, for a short conversation about the main themes of the talk, compassion, religion, and the environment. Mary Evelyn is a senior lecturer and research scholar at Yale University where she teaches in a joint master's degree program between the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and the Yale Divinity School. And uh, she is also, and perhaps more importantly, uh, the director of uh, the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale together with her husband, John Grimm. The program will conclude with an opportunity for His Holiness to address questions from the audience now, over the past week or so, we've collected questions by email from those who would attend today's address, and we have received an enthusiastic response and have selected a representative sample of them. So, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge at least a few individuals who were instrumental in making His Holiness's visit to Yale possible. So, my heartfelt thanks go, of course, uh, to the Chubb Fellowship, to Master Jeff Brenzel and Susan Wigler, to George Joseph of the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies, and uh, of course to the incredible staff, the indefatigable staff of the Yale Himalaya Initiative, including Program Director Alark Saxena, Anoba Gurung, Priyankar Chand, and Sangye Dorje. So, Your Holiness. First, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you, Tashi Dele. Tashi Dele, Tashi Gugida. Lasso, don't ask a Gugida. Nere, Masin, Tashi Dele Kayaha. Tashi Dele means may you be filled with auspicious goodness and joy.
and Tari de Yale University Lia Yongaki, Kashre, Mise, Dejanga, Shosh, Sunche, and Dea, Yonga Tari Chef Dan, Mixe to Tirinde, Kashre, that the Tari Chef to Tushi Shines, Larinde, Yale University, Yonak, Tari Chef de Kashre. And I would also like to thank everyone at Yale University who has uh, been responsible for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to be here. And honestly, uh, and I would also like to thank all of you who have come here today. um <laughs> This is my third visit to the United States of America. And whenever I come here, I have a special feeling of freedom and joy, especially this time, the third time, as I've been visiting several universities, I've uh, been overjoyed by the experience of meeting with many students and witnessing a little bit of their study and university life. <laughs> now, the topic you've asked me to address is compassion and the environment. background background to give you a little bit of background, uh, many people have asked me, uh, what inspired you to become so concerned about the environment? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that to begin. And, modern development and and Dana Singi, as a Sugungi, Dakarjo Toa Gedan, the Tone, and Kuruia, as a Tongjan of Gadachim, Tachimoka Zuyeva, Dana Kuru Dang, Miburu and Deva, Mizek and Deva Shatan. That day, Mina, the Digi, Susu Yamsunya, Koko Chunya, Indusane, Digun Zen Dene, Semlia. Sutub 
Tiji Tsona Samuji, Jinyo Bachi Ngang Tso Dos. I was born in a quite isolated part of Eastern Tibet. And where I was born, uh, there had been no great uh, modern development. So I lived in a very natural and somewhat pristine environment until I was seven. Uh, this was the only environment in which I lived. So I experienced firsthand as a child a feeling of intimate connection with the natural environment. And I retain to this day a constant and extremely clear recollection of this. But an example to show you, but I'm also paying you a rich redang energy children, the Maguare, the Mansi, as a G Holy Spirit, some of the Dutch Tatum Bridge, Hadwich, the Hadda Luda, the Lesson of Dance, the Nedim, each year, just an Azushirak, the Digi. Sadan Doda the dig Dushia Majevichi. The living beings and I'd rather living system of Tinichi Bajidan, Nazula Be so Kazwe necessary and I'd rather so crucial. Did you see Bajing Azu? You see to see your head. Dana Simpanazu, Numbeg Jujut in the yard. The Chu, the Babchu. Babchu. And Babchu is steam, some of the Megan showing me that it is to Jan of Simbachi, pollution chant of Yavuchi, the dead of Chigar, just at the dead Tony Kandar Kashwe Kuzugi, same with Nalolia, nature environment, the Kashwe Saturan of Jamaimbachi, the living systems, Rado, Fladan, Ludan, the dead to Shirichi to Stane, the dead to see some of the show you for example, where I was born, we regarded and experienced our environment as a living system, a, a living beings. The mountains, the sources of water, were all regarded as the dwelling places of what I would call holy spirits of various kinds. We therefore respected every aspect of the environment as part of a living system. We didn't wash our clothes or even our hands in a flowing of water sources. We didn't cast uh, any kind of garbage or any kind of other pollutant into the fire uh, in our hearth. So we regarded the entire environment as innately sacred. <laughs> Mazuk Lumbena, Umachi, artificial garbage, somewhere, the Degi, Kini, Gigla Service, Kini, Mavi Inza, Mazuta, Kini, Samolo, the use reusables and Adaka, the Junki, Kini Madabe, artificial Kini Skay or Mada. Says that things are artificial Kini, this so lay on Dusane, Mazuk Lumbe Milia, Kuzu Sambal, Uman, and Shinke, Ranjunki. Artificial One of the challenges that those who live in such an environment face nowadays is the use of uh, artificial and non-biodegradable uh, substances because for the first time uh, they have to deal with real garbage. 
we didn't really have garbage because we used pretty well everything up and anything that we did dispose of was uh, easily biodegradable. And now, because of the introduction of artificial materials that are not biodegradable, we, we have to come up with new ways uh, to dispose of them. And so this, uh, to give you one example, is uh, changing the lifestyle of people in such places. Canada, the environment, the philosophy, the science, the science, science, the science, science, the 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 science, Obviously, as a child, I had no knowledge of philosophy or science, but I had a strong emotional connection with and a strong feeling for the environment which means that now that I've begun to acquire a little bit of knowledge, it isn't just knowledge. For me, it's based on my strong feelings. Yes, I'm going to say that Kuryu Gi Tadadi Kajweda um I think that in order to understand the uh, necessity of environmental protection, we need to understand how connected we are to one another and to our environment. So in order to understand our, our connectedness, I think we need to understand interdependence. Lots of eco. Yeah, I'm having a really hard time hearing. I'm sorry. What to do? I don't know. Maybe if I move back. Really? Might be better. <laughs> Maybe you can sit down? No? They did drink that. This is. Lasso. Oh. I'm forgot my things also. Okay. The Mazugi Save Sedang, Sag Kalada, and the Jayal Tuloda, and Tana Mazugi Lundinia, some of the Kashway, the Ranjungi Kuya, Dance, Tokyo, and a Ranjungi Kuya, Dene, Nego, which is Tadi others. For example, for us to uh, acquire or eat any food, have clothes to wear, or even to have the bodies we do, all of these things require the interconnectedness uh, of many aspects, of many things and many people within the environment. <laughs> Object, subject. Object, subject, 
Chigi Ranjunku de Pa G object dropchik Azu subject dropchik. The Nijigi under boundary rich summer with other jigi Kashwe Tiber Perulea Parta Yabuchi. The Dijik Azu Tungu Arem says an Azu Tindeg Parta di Yanta di near Tongua Chigda. Boundary rich this Mab Sokati, Ketchum Chati was on. Ting Azu di Kashwe a Tinjun Gitawa Tel Dench. The value of understanding interdependence in this regard is that we often feel at some distance from our environment. We divide the world into subject and object, and we feel that the external environment is an object separated from us by some kind of boundary and at some distance from we, from ourselves as subjects. We need to dissolve this artificial boundary and decrease the distance between ourselves and our environment. The name is Dane Matsuigi Randa Kuyuk in Jevati, Momati, the Matsu Shedo Tuyajidan, Mazu the Kuyuk in Jevata Tanya Don Alia, Don Tourism of those Tinichevina. And I think if we do that, we can begin to feel how connected we are to our environment and how little distance, if any, there really is between ourselves and our environment. Then the Pibena Lolia Chigi, Kuru Dang, Nangi Semjendi in Javadi, Bezun Karasharasana, Nerd and Chigi Bezun Shat Chikuru di Nerd of Chet, Nangi Semjendi di Jude of Chet, Chikuru digi. Sustaining some of it, hold as some of the hold in the chair of Chita and Nanki Simji and Tamji, Simji and Digiti, any Chiku Dela, then nutrients, nutrients, some of the Chi, the dead of Chi, said the average. That the interesting Tijuns in Dana Tigi, no, then Chigi, Kasu, pension of Tigi. Mazu the Kuyu Javadi and Samu in Devichi Tang, energy necessary in Devichi that did send over the Samtang years. In Tibetan, we often refer to the relationship between the external environment and the beings who inhabit that environment as the relationship between a container and its contents. We are all held by and within the environment we inhabit. We are like the contents or even the nutrients within such an environment. And it seems that it's necessary for us to begin to acknowledge uh, that interrelationship. The Hindustan, the Nijing Devil, you will tell it, and the Kuyogi Nasulia, she got rare. Penuki Penuki Shugan Te or Langazu Yan Kuulia and Shugan Shati Ales. Mima was in Samuel Nalolia, Kuu said the natural said be Yachambuimba, Shuchambuimba. The name to Sane and a Nazuki natural Shugan Teto Marasam Duchi. The reaching you are the engineer, the reality, no need to tell you at the member. Nazu in a Pashugan Te or a Kuu to in a Shugan Te of the Azutu Shingaras. We therefore also need to acknowledge the fact that our environment can affect us and we can also affect our environment. Some people have the idea that the environment is so vast and so primordial that nothing we do is actually going to affect it. Unfortunately, that's been proven not to be the case. And we need to begin to acknowledge the uh, interdependence that the aspect of interdependence that is our effect on the environment, even as our environment affects us. The Indusane, Yena, Tang Azulia, to take knowledge somewhere, the Nichigi, Kashwe, understand you, David Pingo, Madame. Kadu in Azul, Guenzi Kartag Arsana, understanding their energy presence somewhere. Understanding the person, the Barulea, 
Understanding well, we need to acknowledge these things. Mere knowledge or understanding alone, of course, is not enough. One of our problems is that we tend to separate ourselves as persons from our knowledge or understanding. And if we understand or know about the need for environmental protection but do not apply it in our daily lives, uh, we're not going to achieve anything. Our knowledge, our understanding has to become so intimate, so personal to us that it naturally changes our behavior, that we feel it emotionally and in our hearts. We need, therefore, to reflect upon the fact that um, our knowledge of the environment really uh, is a knowledge of something that's going to affect our lives, a knowledge of something that is going to affect our well-being. Energy, because spiritual traditions and around the religious tradition, the Zugi, Kashre, Ji, Shemshi Drutuya, Sana, Shemdi Drutuya, Mangu Kashre, Shemdi Drutuyachi, Yongre Sambed, Isheus. And I think it is in that regard that spiritual and religious traditions can serve the cause of environmental stewardship. The Nidu Sana, that is Nangu Chibu Mane. Taji environmental protection side, the Dub Zamaimba, the Tsini Zama, Garzu Tsiri Zamaimba, the Kandriches Susugi, Garzu Mizina Lolia, Susugi, the Tonanda Jevata, Ning Tavana, the Mizina Lola, La Lente Dalia, then the Garzu Azura, the Tiriji Omer Chevala, Rom Chet or something. And when I say religious traditions, I don't just mean Buddhist traditions. I mean every religious tradition in this world can play its part. And I'm confident that if we do this, if we work together, if we apply the knowledge that is embodied in the many indigenous cultures that have survived, the ancient wisdom of our ancestors, we will be able to uh, discover together that environmental protection is not just a point of view, not just a science, but must be a way of life. In some some Uma David needs to tell ya as a city by the Chulu Sidusane, that Kunin Kasuda Gawan Ganda Dovichi. The name is done the Chigi, some some Chigi and a ton. Chicks 
mau bicara tu, tu mungkin tu ada. Ni ambil sesi tu tu ada je. Yang sesi tu ada. Biarlah, kau ni ada di leh tu ada cewa ini na. Tapi ni ada tu mungkin tu ada. Ngaji sesi tu gua ada, kandre tu ada, sama tu gua ada. Kesian beri. Kalau sana, kau ni ada yang di beyond zaman ni, religion beyond the political tu tu cewa ini tu sana. Ngaji sama ni, ni ambil cewa tu gua ada. Kesian beri macam ni, orang ni kita tunggu. At various times in our history, uh, science and religion have seemed uh, to be contradictory to one another, have even become enemies, attacked one another, or to be more polite, refuted one another. But really, there is a great commonality of experience that we all share. We're all human beings living in the same world, relying on the same environment. And therefore, on that basis, on the basis of acknowledging our shared or common experience, we have to accept that the protection of this environment is beyond the views of any one uh, religion. Tak ngaji, niem do take responsibility je je, niem do lekali gua di, tak kerja cuma sih cuci tadi. Labar do, kuyuk ni ada yang tinggal zat awal sih cuci ada ada. Jadi, ngaji tu, scientist mampu cegi ngaji kerja information mampu cegi ada. Tapi ini mampu cegi ya, information mampu cegi ya, ane di tak boleh jam ni, lain tanya. Tanya mereka kan, tanda tu tak gawat jangan itu je, mampu yang dia tu pernah climate scientist tu sun gawat jangan itu je. Tu itu sangat tinggi juga dia ni. Macam gaya ni am tu kuku ada kerja macam ni sesuatu. If we base our approach to environmental stewardship on being loving and compassionate, there should be no contradiction between science and spirituality. We can share, undertake and share our common responsibility for this environment. And in that way, actually put into practice and make practical use of the information that scientists give us about the environment and not live as though we are in denial of it. Pernah ngaran kerja tu je. Pernah ngajuk pergi Himalaya tu, anu pergi pergi sahaja di entah jika kerja Asia, jika kerja Chunzu entah apa, Chunzu entah apa, siapa dia jika tang, dah ni sama sahaja third pole segala. Jadi tang, kuyu tu ane, sana kerja ni siapa dia orang. Jadi di kuih ulu sungguh siapa kalau ya tang di di tol ya, si kasur ini kotor biar saya tu, angkut di thomar si Himalaya tu, regulir dia biar gundit di tol ya angkut lobster je. Anu kasur kuih di kacang bimbi, kuih kalau ya kotor biar, an dene juz ya, ane si kasur community dia, sugen teh tu ya. The Himalaya, including the Tibetan and the Tibetan Plateau, are uh, considered a, a treasury of water that feed uh, the great rivers of Asia and therefore supply so much water that they, sometimes the, the Himalaya is called a third pole. Therefore, we have to be especially concerned with the environment in the Himalaya and the conservation of water there. So what we have uh, tried to do is train uh, monasteries and best Himalayan monasteries and best environmental practices so that they can then present these uh, to their local or neighboring communities. 
Tomang or Jay and Dusan and Tangolo, she casually very motionless number of the Simgushi Rateje and a Dajik Mazuchi, Chigi, some sort of Chi, Mima Vasilia, the Simgushi Mushi, Gumashi Tayare. In a Samsung Azura, the lack of sobre, sobre, Daji knowledge, some scientific knowledge, Dang and Dana Singi, technique, Tizung Azulia, Yunuibe, Gun. When this subject was first introduced to representatives of these monasteries, they were immediately emotionally affected and demonstrated tremendous commitment to environmental stewardship in their region. But at the same time, we lack a scientific knowledge and a technical expertise. So in order to do this, we need the support of the scientific community and the assistance of the scientific community. And I mention this as an example of how, in order to preserve our environment, we all need to work together and offer our individual skills and knowledge. I'm going to uh, end my initial uh, address or talk with that, and we'll begin the uh, conversation. Before we do, however, I again want to thank each and every one of you uh, for coming here and uh, convey to you my sincere delight in having this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you make a glass of water? <laughs> thank you, Your Holiness, and thank you, Translator. Yeah. We wanted to begin by picking up on a point that you've made earlier yes. about the root of compassion is having a steadfast heart, the power of the heart. And this work with the environment for many people can be discouraging because it's so overwhelming mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. So could you speak about this need for a steadfast heart, the power of the heart mm -hmm. in compassion? Daddy. Mm -hmm. oh, Activist. <laughs> The activist Lia activist Marche Dinane Gajweda Kuruk activist Marche takes emotional charo, Marche Tezi Gajweda G. Kuzugi, Bezuman Wuchenang, G. Sancho, you are twine maybe in the Marche Kondolanding at the Charisha. Not at least near to what's. Well, first of all, I would say that um, many activists, and especially environmental activists, um, naturally become highly emotionally invested in their activism. And when after years and years of very hard work, they don't see a great deal of result, they can become a little bit uh, embittered and angry. And then as you some of the and Krug, you <laughs> and if you spend enough time listening to one dire prediction about the future of this planet after another from environmental scientists, even we listeners uh, can uh, develop a little bit of a problem in our brains. Yeah. Ring just that. Yeah, I'm doing this activist sadly. 
I think there are two levels or types of activism, and the one is what we all uh, practice. We can practice it by being uh, supportive of intensive activism, but even if we uh, are in denial of the need for environmental activism, because we're having an effect on the environment, you can call it a type of mere activism. The other type of activist is what we would normally refer to as an environmental activist, and that's someone who intentionally undertakes responsibility and puts great effort into the achievement of, in this case, environmental goals and changes. I think that one thing that's very important is for uh, those of us who are less directly involved to take some responsibility and be supportive uh, as much as we can of environmental activism. Because if you look at the situation, there is absolutely no reason not to support environmental activism. ตาดิเนี่ยยุสตานะเป็นงานดับจริงมีนะเอ่อตาดิเนี่ยเวจิเทเรียนซะเดอะเดอะสุสุเชทุยาจิลําซะเชทชอยสุสุปาทาเจน
Samba Samba Zong Yiko Menji Ba Lalen. Lalen Tayak. Samba Samba Yenang, Lalen Tango, which is Lalen Tayak. You mean how to bridge yeah. good intentions yeah. into the Samba Samba Dong? Ngusa Lalen Tango Ke Bata Ke Samba Dawa Ka Tandra Yod. Tahaja. Bridge. That is the Actually, you can repeat that again. Sure. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, your, your Holiness, you, you mentioned yourself. Uh, you've written before and in talks that you've given that when you were quite young, you were yeah. fond of eating meat. Mm -hmm. But you had the good intention of giving that up. You now yeah. are vegetarian. Yes. And that is taking a good intention and putting it into Still, action. I like meat, but it's okay. But many people wonder how to take a good intention and to actually okay. put it into practice. Okay. Put it into practice. Daddy. ก็ได้ลองดูดิเอ่อเป็นงานอะไรนะเป็นงานร้านเราชิมมีนะอันนี้จิกระเรทุนดูนี่ชาสอยอะไรอันนี้ดูสตาร์ทอันนี้ดู
this is no longer an issue of science alone, mm -hmm. but a moral issue. Mm -hmm. And that's what your work encourages us in yeah. this new dialogue of yeah. science and religion. Can you speak on that? Wow. <sighs> uh, as you the Kashmir, the Kongsuman said, Kuyuk Nedun, the Panlang Nedun, the moral issue. Human greed, Personal practitioner person mi ge so so liya ji pento ye bazan do mase be che so to ane bena ji global issues amar be bena ji khuyu ne de ina general issue re ti ju to ali mina che so to ane den den gi katre ji ti to ali mina che to ane ma katre ji lang dor ki lang ga se bu ten go ati ge chu shi bere sam thang ge so sam sam ti ga ju gi che u ti de ti ju to ane Feeling. Information. The Environmental protection or conservation uh, is fundamentally a moral issue. And the, the reason, the, the fundam, the crucial um, factor in it that makes it a moral issue is that the degradation or destruction of the environment has been caused by human greed. And our human greed uh, bad enough as it is to start with, has only been exacerbated, fed, by our media and our advertising industry. The problem we face, therefore, is that human desire is limitless, but environmental resources are limited. And therefore, it is our responsibility as those who depend on these resources to rein in and control our greed. In order that we, we start doing so, it is essential that religious leaders, spiritual leaders, spiritual teachers, not only preach about individual practice issues or, or individual moral codes, but also about global issues 
and that they provide in moral guidance on environmental stewardship because they are the ones who can evoke feeling, mm -hmm. evoke enthusiasm, evoke an emotional commitment uh, in their followers. Until we accept the fact that our environment is not external to us, it pervades us, it's within our bodies and our minds as well, it will be difficult for us to, to change our behavior. But the key to becoming really motivated to change the way we live and uh, thereby begin to heal the environment, the key that will open the door to that type of motivation seems to be in the hands of those religious and spiritual leaders who are willing to provide moral guidance concerning the environment that is based on sound scientific knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So to take the conversation in a slightly different direction, Your Holiness, you spoke about the practice of dissolving the distinction between subject and object, the inner and outer worlds. And of course, there are many techniques for putting that into practice in meditation. You can study about that. You can uh, practice it. But I wonder, does the practice of cultivating, of dissolving that distinction, naturally lead to a feeling of connection for the environment, for an appreciation of the environment? No. Appreciation. The practice of the meditation is not the meditation. The meditation is not the the Nyamlin そうすぎ、ほはじりそもそも 100% uh, a number of meditation practices, as you mentioned in your question, concerned with dissolving, dissolving excuse me, the uh, false boundary between self and other. One of these is contemplating the equality of oneself and others, which is fundamentally developing an empathetic uh, recognition that just as I want to be happy and not suffer, uh, so uh, do others, and that in that we're exactly the same. And once you have taken this to heart, then of course you have to put it into practice and live accordingly. We also do meditations on exchanging oneself for others, mm -hmm. where you actually imagine yourself in the position of another and that other in the position of yourself. When you try to imagine as wholeheartedly, as 100% as possible, how they feel, what they're going through, and then apply that. So there should be ways to extrapolate from these techniques and apply them to environmental awareness. Nature, 
Kandar ngaco si uge jua cipu inde bici, uge lam cipu inde bici, uge jua cipu inde bici, ngaco tak kandar si uge tangsar bici inde bici. Tende si ke tolia, ane si meditation si hebi na tende ngaco si sonang di si kandar mesin di bici ke nalol, de uge jua cipu, jua langga di bici ke inde, de si sam tonga si kiri sam tonga dos. For example, if we think about the fact that um, trees, so to speak, breathe out, well, we need to breathe in oxygen, and we breathe out carbon dioxide, which they seem to need to, so to speak, breathe in, so that our exhaust is their air, and their exhaust is our air, it's, this is something we don't need to imagine. This is a fact. So if you contemplate that, just the interrelationship or interconnectedness of breathing, of our breathing and the vegetation, things that grow, that could be a meditation technique in and of itself. Because if you feel that, you realize that we're really two parts of one whole machine or one whole system. We wanted to give a chance for a few questions from the audience which were submitted okay. in advance. Yes, yes. So maybe two, yes, two. out of yes. some very Thank good you. questions. Thank you. The first one is on climate change. Mm -hmm. Climate change or global warming appears to be the world's greatest crisis. Mm -hmm. But there are many people who deny global warming exists. What advice would you give to working with people in the government who believe there is no need to protect the environment? <laughs> oh, I don't have all the solutions. <laughs> uh, I think this is... Oh... You don't have to answer it either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, oh yeah, this, that really, uh, the culture, um, choosing the Kuyugi in Yundua Zad, Nemsi in Yundua, climate change Zad, Gatchen was shooting. Gatcheta Chene, Tin Yundua, the Nazuita, Gotum, the Tortuum, Gatcheta Chen, Tormento. ตายเนี่ยนี่มันจะท้อช่วยกันเลยจริงๆนะทุเรียนชาเดียร์เดี๋ยวจริงเดี๋ยวจริงดีอินดูสันดีจุนเซเดเน่ดีนายเชงกัน
um, it's not really in our minds most of the mm -hmm. time. And then there are little pockets of odd reactions. For example, uh, Tibetans, Tibet is a very cold country. It's often hard to get warm enough. And so the uh, global warming, some Tibetans have greeted this with enthusiasm, <laughs> saying it doesn't get as cold as it used to. It's much more pleasant. As for what to do about uh, politicians and others who are uh, active or outspoken climate change deniers, the best thing might be to appeal to support from religious and spiritual leaders mm -hmm. because they have so much influence over their uh, respective communities or, or devotees. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, Your Holiness, the last question is one a number of our uh, undergraduate students asked. And that is, how can students at, in a university like Yale organize themselves to take fruitful and positive action for the environment? What can they do that's practical? demonstration <laughs> ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、
on Buddhism and ecology, yes. and then the other world religions yes. and ecology. Yes. But it is our great joy that Yale has picked up this idea that religions and ecology can work together, which you have highlighted today. And our school of forestry and environmental studies, with the students there and students from religious studies and divinity, I think are giving us hope because they understand this. They want to work with your communities and we want to figure ways into the future. I want to end though with a special thanks um, to our Dean, Peter Crane, who has held up this effort between the School of Forestry, Environmental Studies, and Divinity. And tomorrow night, we're going to continue the conversation with Peter Crane, scientists, ethicists, and so on, between these two schools to examine the new papal encyclical which will be coming out this summer exactly on that, this issue, which can affect a billion Catholics, two billion Christians, but be in dialogue with the efforts that you're doing. So tomorrow night at Lindsay Hall on High Street at 5.30, we invite you to join in this discussion that will complement the wonderful words that you have given us tonight. Thank you for your hope, and please come back to Yale yes. to visit us. Please do come Thank back. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.